As we have all navigated a pandemic for the past two years and mourn those that have lost their lives, engineers and scientists have been developing solutions since the very beginning. From social distancing barriers and 3D printed masks to wastewater biomarker analysis and life-saving vaccines and virtually everything in between. Today, we're joined by material science and engineering professor Karina Guma, who is innovating to improve COVID-19 testing. She leads a team of Ohio State researchers developing a device capable of detecting the virus with just a single exhaled breath. If you have the distinct displeasure of a nasal swab test, you'll surely join me in saying, yes, please. Welcome. I'm Ayanna Howard, Dean of Engineering at The Ohio State University, and this is Ingenuity. And yes, we're wearing masks, quite stylish if I might say so myself. Karina Guma is the Edward Orton Jr. Chair in Ceramic Engineering at Ohio State. She is a professor in both the Department of Material Science and Engineering and the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Dr. Guma's research activities involve the synthesis and characterization of nanomaterials for bio and chemical sensors, as well as the development of artificial olfaction systems. She has established novel and highly successful programs on nanomedicine with emphasis on the development of non-invasive breath and skin-based diagnostic tools. Her work has been featured in media outlets including NPR, The New York Times, and Wired, among many others. Karina, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Dean Howard. It's an honor to be invited to join your podcast. So all of us know what a breathalyzer is. Well, you know, some of us more than others. And most of us associate breathalyzers with detecting alcohol intoxication. But for nearly 20 years, 20 years, you have been developing breath-based diagnostics technology for healthcare purposes. Can you take our listeners back to when you started this amazing, innovative pursuit? Yes, actually, I was a new assistant professor back in uh, 2000, the year 2000, and I was working on uh, materials for chemical sensors. Actually, I had developed a highly selective ammonia sensor for the Ford Motor Company to be used uh, in a selective catalytic reduction systems. Uh, then I had a project from the National Science Foundation to develop a biosensor for urea that was detecting ammonia. So I had an industrial automotive application, I have a medical application, and both involved selective detection of a chemical. One day I was walking into a home goods store and I came across a gadget. It was actually an alcohol breathalyzer. And I realized that it was using similar technology like the one I was developing, only that was very generic sensors like the ones you have in the carbon monoxide detector, for example, the tin dioxide sensors and mine were highly specific. So then I had this idea, why don't then I make a handheld device that utilizes a single exhale and then use it to detect ammonia in breath using my own sensors. Uh, and that was really the first time anyone had considered using a single exhale for medical diagnostics. So I set out to uh, pursue this avenue for my research. I carried out a lot of uh, work in that area. I developed a nitric oxide sensor for asthma, for example, a very selective acetone sensor for metabolic uh, rate monitoring and eventually for diabetes. And it was uh, typically one sensor uh, for one particular chemical in the breath, which we call biomarkers, because really these are resulting for this result from metabolic changes that happen in the body, so you tell, they tell you if you are healthy or not. Uh, later on, I started working with combinations of uh, chemicals, and uh, that's where we came uh, uh, 2000, 2017. Uh, it was, uh, I published a paper with two of my collaborators, and that involved the detection of flu using a breath test. Beautiful. So, you know, I 
you said Ford Motor Company and Automotive, and when you talk about hand handheld analyzers mm -hmm. and automotive, it freaks people out, but you've evolved in terms of these metal applications with asthma and diabetes mm -hmm. and, and now COVID-19. And so now that you are applying this technology to, ve to develop a COVID-19 breathalyzer test, I mean, how did that, how did that even begin? So you talked about asthma, diabetes, even flu, mm -hmm. but what was the leap to say, oh, this actually applies to our current situation? Yes, yeah, so what happened is it was uh, actually February 2019, and the pandemic was not declared yet, but there was a need, there was this uh, cruise ship out in the Pacific with uh, over 2,000 people, I think, and uh, there was no way to test them uh, in a timely manner, so one, uh, was really becoming uh, one that was infecting the other. And that's when the White House called me Dr. Navarro's office, and uh, they had read my paper on the flu breath test. By the way, that paper, my patent attorney says, was kind of prophetic because it was the first time someone was uh, um, discussing how you can really uh, use the breath to prevent, to, to, to uh, detect a pandemic or a, 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 an infectious disease. And uh, they asked me if we can really modify the breath test for flu to detect uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19. And my answer was, I had no clue. <laughs> and that was the truth because not many people knew much about it. But then the way I went about it was to assemble a team of experts. So I worked with Professor Bauman from the Vet Med School who is expert in infectious diseases and uh, he was uh, studying coronaviruses in animals for a long time. And then with Dr. Uh, Matthew X. Line at the Wexner Medical Center who was uh, treating COVID-19 from the beginning. And I had a long-standing electrical engineering collaborator. So then the four of us sat down and said, we have to have a plan and we really have to start making a breath test for COVID-19. And uh, we, uh, so I came up with some uh, potential biomarkers by identifying the differences and the similarities between the flu and COVID-19. And uh, we set out during the lockdown, I received permission by the College of Engineering. I'm very grateful to the college for that. So myself and two of my graduate students were working to uh, day and night under lockdown to make the sensors, to make the devices. And then uh, with the help of the Wexner Medical Center and Dr. X. Lyons team, we were able to carry out clinical testing to validate both the sensors and the technology for uh, the detection of uh, the infection caused by the SARS-CoV-2. So this is amazing. So first off, I, I don't know if the audience heard, but the White House called. I mean, you just said it's so fluid. Like, oh yes, when the White House called, they asked me. I mean, just amazing. And, and you know, one of the things that I admire is when they ask you about it and can you do it, you as an engineer said, I have no clue, but we will figure it out. Yes. Um, and okay. you collaborated with medical professionals, mm -hmm. works in the medical center. And so a lot of times people don't realize that engineering is this collaborative kind of activity. Oh. And we don't always have the answers, but we can definitely figure it out. And so I want to ask you, thinking of all the dozens of active collaborations between Ohio mm -hmm. State engineers and colleagues in the College of Medicine, Wexner Medical Center that you mentioned, do you enjoy partnering with clinicians and medical professionals? Yes, I love it. And the idea is we as engineers can contribute so much to medicine. And of course, the physicians can contribute so much to us because the, for example, the breath test is one example of non-invasive diagnostics, which is affordable, it's non-invasive, non-intrusive, it takes really 15 seconds and you know, and that can really revolutionize how uh, we can do public health screening in the future, in the near future, I hope. The other thing is there is tissue engineering. The physicians used to stitch Dacron, a very stiff polymer in the heart, when someone had myocardial infarction. Now, we have all these uh, uh, materials that are the tissue engineer. We have these synthetic uh, um, model scaffolds, and they can really allow gr uh, cells to grow and proliferate. So there are so many ways, and then there are robotics applications. So engineering really can influence medicine and can make uh, can give solutions from everything, from the drug delivery to the therapeutics processing, to the development, to the um, 
uh, for knowing uh, theragnostics, whether the uh, treatment is really working or not. So yes, I think if we have more of these collaborations, the world is going to be a much better place. And I agree. So how close are we seeing the Ohio State COVID breathalyzer test in the market? Yes, so we have uh, submitted an application uh, for an emergency use authorization in EUA with the FDA, and uh, they've been uh, reviewing it. So we are hopeful that this is going to happen sooner <laughs> rather than later, and uh, we really like to see the breath test to become ubiquitous. So you mentioned this word nanotechnology, and, and some people may have visions of, you know, far out science fiction movies, and others are like, I have no idea what she's talking about. So could you give us a little summary of what is nanotechnology? Yeah, of course. So what nanotechnology involves materials, and materials are all the stuff that everything is made of, and they are coming in very, very small dimensions. These are like a thousand times smaller than the human hair. And when you make materials in such small uh, sizes, then they have unique properties. So you can control these properties and they give you different functionalities. That's why we were able now to detect chemicals at very high precision uh, that we were not able to do when Linus Pauling was doing, for example, the GC mass spectroscopy to find out the gases in breath. That's why we are able now to uh, detect minute, trivial amounts of chemicals and differentiate between different chemicals. So we know that, for example, we detect ammonia versus nitric oxide or versus the thousands of other gases that are in breath. And we do that not only with high, what we call it, accuracy and sensitivity, we do that also with selectivity and very, very fast because these reactions are happening in very, very short time, in milliseconds. What are some of the specific applications or disease targets for, for your specific technology? Mm -hmm. And what do you envision in, say, five or 10 or even 20 years? Yeah, and even sooner, I think. We are been, uh, looking, for example, now to um, develop models how the metabolic uh, uh, rate changes uh, and how to correlate that with the acetone in the breath. We are looking into cystic fibrosis detection by using a breath test. Uh, there is a lot of interest also in other diseases, and of course these are all physicians from OSU. Uh, we've been interacting anything from sleep apnea detection uh, to getting uh, colon cancer screening that is going to be, again, breath-based. And personally, I really want to find out how we can detect early lung cancer because this is one of the silent killers, and you can really not tell until it is too late. And I'm sure there's a biomarker out there that has been, and we are looking into, for example, a uh, difference between alkanes and alkenes. And there are many other things we can explore. And of course, the limitation is funding. So educating uh, federal agencies and educating uh, private organizations to fund this type of interdisciplinary, uh, cross-disciplinary or cross-nanomedicine you know, kind of work, I think it's very important. I agree. And, and one of the things, if you think about all of the types of applications, you mentioned sleep apnea, cystic fibrosis. You also mentioned a breath-based test for colon cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, for any of our listeners who have ever had to have a test, just imagine you just breathe mm -hmm. and voila, you find out yes or no. Yeah, and actually the ancient physicians, they knew that. They will smell the breath and they will know if someone is sick or not. And there are terms that survive to date, like fetor hepatecus, for this smelly, fizzy breath of someone who's dying from liver cancer. So we just have, we have the tools now with uh, nanotechnology and we can make things happen. So I hope we invest in that. Okay, so is anyone else out there ready for a breath of fresh air? in the healthcare and virus testing field? I know I am. And we should all be grateful that Perina Guma has dedicated her career to this novel convergence of material science, nanotechnology, and medical diagnostics. I appreciate her joining us today for this timely episode of Ingenuity. If you like what you heard and are interested in learning more or suggesting your own topics, be sure to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at OSU Engineering. Thanks for listening.